Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? It is a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Francesca Pariza, who is an assistant professor of ECE. She has recently joined us. Uh, before coming to Cornell, she was a postdoc at uh, the Laboratory for Information and Decision Systems at MIT. Uh, she defended her thesis at ETH in 2016 and received a, a BS and an MS in information and automation engineering uh, from the University of Padova in Italy. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have her speaking today at our systems engineering seminar. She will be speaking on targeted dynamic interventions and SIR epidemic models. And she'll correct me if I'm wrong. I think SIR is susceptible, infective, and recovered. Perfect. Uh, Francesca. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for having me in this seminar series. It's really a pleasure. Uh, so again, what I'm gonna talk about is basically some recent work on dynamic intervention for epidemic models. And let me start by saying that I'm not an epidemiologist myself. So uh, my background is more in control and optimization. So this work would have not been possible if it was not for collaboration with actually many other people. Um, like Asuman Ustaglar, Ali Reza Falla, Sarat Patil, and Dan Hattenlocker from MIT ECS, uh, Daron Asomoglu from MIT Economics, and then Giacomo Como and Leonardo Ciampanelli from the Politecnico of Torino uh, in Italy, and Andrea Giometto, who is uh, at Civil and Environmental Engineering here at Cornell. Okay, so the, the, the motivation for this talk is, I guess, that um, we we can agree that we are in an unprecedented time uh, for kind of understanding and appreciating the role that science has or may have in our everyday life. And so science in particular, but in the specific mathematical epidemiology has clearly played a very fundamental role in how our handling of the COVID-19 pandemic really taking on life and death decision. And so, for example, in this paper here in Science, they comment on the role that mathematical modeling, for example, had um, in UK, where modeling of Imperial College had fundamentally affected policy from different governments. And then looking a little bit closer, here is the CDC website for US, um, and they really explicitly say that mathematical modeling helps CDC to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic by informing decision about planning, resource allocation, and social distancing measure and other type of intervention. Um, even all that, I think it's also important, however, to stress that mathematical epidemiology is not a new field. In fact, it has a very long history um, that dates back to the uh, 17th uh, century. Um, so one of the first work, for example, was by Bernoulli, um, and had to do with smallpox and decision of whether to inoculate people or not in or understanding like what is the expected uh, life uh, span of people under different choices. And then if we look a little bit closer in the 19th century, we have uh, fundamental works by Hammer, Kermack and McKendrick that started introducing this idea of compartmental models. And this is something we're gonna kind of look more in the details, but somehow classifying people depending on their state in regard to a disease. And there's been a lot of interesting uh, and amazing work since then. And I kind of uh, wanted to highlight some of these surveys that I find myself very useful when I started kind of looking into epidemic modeling. Um, to kind of understand a little bit the evolution of this field and how we came up what we are today. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to stress that the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted that there is need actually for new research um, and in particular related to uh, non-pharmacological intervention. So instead of like classic intervention, like a vaccination policies, I think what COVID-19 stress is that at the beginning of an epidemic, this, no medical, this medical intervention may not be available. And therefore one needs to think of how do we control this disease by looking at the non-pharmacological side. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to stress in this talk why this introduced new challenges. So really the plan for today is, is that I will start by recapping one of the key model of mathematical epidemiology, which is the SIR model. Again, this date back to the 1900. 
Um, and this part will be more of a didactical type of flavor, like a little bit of an introduction to mathematical epidemiology. And then I will move to describe what are the new challenges. I will try to highlight what are some new areas of research that are needed, and also a little bit highlight some results that we derived in collaboration with the people I've mentioned in the previous slide regarding two particular types of intervention, which are lockdown and testing. Okay, so let me start by basically introducing the SIR model. So here the main idea is that we take a population where we have N agents and we divide them into compartments according to different stages of the epidemic. So again, SIR model, we have three compartments. S stands for susceptible agent. These are people that did not have the disease yet, so they could uh, potentially have it. Um, infected agents, that are people that are currently infected. And then recover agents are people that had it in the past. And in the SIR model, we're going to assume they are immune, so they cannot actually um, be infected again. And I just want to quickly mention that this is somehow the very fundamental model of epidemic. Uh, but of course, if you want to go and model specific disease like COVID-19, you uh, need to kind of enlarge these and you can make it much, much more complex. This is one example where you start like really dividing into many different compartments depending on each particular stage of the epidemic. Um, so just as a caveat, I want to mention here, I will not go into these details. We're always going to work with the SIR model again, because our objective is kind of extract the fundamental key feature of epidemic dynamics and try to have some basic understanding how different interventions affect epidemics. But then again, if you want to then implement that in practice, of course, you need to fine tune the things that I'm going to say today and the insight that we're going to derive for the specific disease you're talking about. And again, we are not going to look at that part um, in this talk. Okay, so let me go back to basically the SIR model. Uh, the first main important thing to understand is how do agents move from one compartment to the other? And clearly this may happen because of different events. And so the first event that uh, can happen is an infection. And that of course will lead one agent from moving from the S compartment to the I compartment. And this will happen because of contacts with infected individuals. And then the other fundamental event that may happen is a recovery. So agents will move from the I to the R compartment uh, at the end of their illness. And this is somehow spontaneously, of course, just follows the natural uh, progress of the illness. And it's important to understand how do we describe basically these different type of events. And in fact, there's two different ways of broad classes of models that you can consider. So one class of model is that to say that agents move, so these events happen in a random fashion, so with different rates. And that would lead to a large scale Markov process where you track basically each agent in what state it is and how does it move. And um, of course, that gives you a very good understanding of what's happening, but it's typically less tractable analytically. So in the limit of large population, what people did was to derive what are known as the deterministic or mean field model, where instead you assume you have homogeneous, well-mixed large population. And under those assumptions, you see that you don't need to really track what each individual is doing, but you will just track what the fraction or mean of individual is in every different state. Um, and this is somehow gives a, a little bit more analytic tractability. And again, this is a good approximation if you have large populations. And so today I'm going to focus mainly on this deterministic model part. Okay, so let me go into the deterministic SIR model and that really explain how do we model these events. And so starting from the infection event, um, what we are gonna say is that every susceptible agent has beta interaction per day. And again, in the assumption of well-mixed population, we're gonna assume that these are randomly selected to other agents. So if I have a randomly selected agent, the probability that this agent is gonna be infected if I have a fraction of infected that it's I in my population, it's gonna be exactly I, right? Like I have an agent, I fraction of that as infected. If I randomly sample one, the probability that this is gonna be infected is gonna be I. So overall, we have that a susceptible agent has a rate of infectious interactions, meaning interaction with an infected agent, so beta times I. And then of course, uh, if we want to model how the fraction of susceptible, which is here S, changes in time, we know that we have S susceptible, the rate at which they become infected is beta I, 
So susceptible number will decrease at a rate that is beta SI. And again, there's two things important here. There's the product between S and I, again, because this involves some interaction between different agents in the compartment S and compartment I. And the other thing to note is that this quantity is always negative. So the number of susceptible actually is always decreasing in a SIR model. And we're gonna use that property in a moment. So that describes how S uh, goes to I. And then the other thing is how do I uh, recover? So how does the dynamic of the I compartment change? Uh, and again, note that of course, whatever goes out of the S compartment needs to go in the I compartment. So that's why we have here the exact same term, but with positive sign. And then we have people leaving the compartment because of recovery. And that for every infected agent I happens with a rate gamma, which you should really think as one over the duration of the illness. So that on average, basically your agent will stay for a time the duration of the illness in the I compartment and then move to the recovered. And note that here, I don't have an equation for the recover because again, SIR are gonna be the fraction of susceptible infected and recover agents. And since I'm like, agents need to be in one of these compartments, these three number will sum up always to one, right? So um, that basically the recover, you can always compute them as one minus S minus I. So that's why I don't keep track of R and we'll never look at these dynamics because there's this like conservation of mass. Okay, so overall, what we discuss here is that we can basically detail how this system evolved with these two very simple uh, ODEs. And so the next question is now that we have a model for our system is of course, uh, understanding what can, what can the system do? What will happen if I give you a certain initial condition, a certain fraction of susceptible and infected, what will happen to my system? Um, and it turns out that for this model, actually there is a very neat, and simple threshold result that says that basically you have to compute this R0, which I'm sure that many of you have heard, this is known as the reproduction number, which is beta S0 over gamma. And the neat result is that if R0 is less than one, then your epidemic will die out quickly. And in fact, if you look at number of infected, that will decrease monotonically. While if that is this R0 is greater than one, that what's gonna happen is that you'll have a large outbreak. So the number of infected will initially grow. And in fact, it will grow at an exponential rate. And then you see, if we look a little bit further, you'll see there's gonna be a peak at a certain point, And after that point, the number of infected will go down. And to understand kind of this phenomena, you can define this quantity R0T, which is really the same as R0, but evaluated at time T. So number of susceptible at time T. And remember, I told you before that S of T is decreasing. So even if R0 at time zero is greater than one, since as S of T is decreasing, there's gonna be a point in time where uh, basically this quantity becomes equal to one. And that's what people call the herd immunity point. Because after that point, basically you have an R0 less than one, and that's why you have this kind of decrease. Um, so basically this is kind of gives us a very nice and tractable intuition of what happened to our system in terms of this quantity R0. And um, so what is this quantity? Actually, that has a nice interpretation because if we look at it, remember beta S0, you can think of it as the number of infectious interactions that an infected person has with susceptible. So this is slightly different from before. Before we were looking at um, susceptible interaction with infectious, if we look at um, interaction between infectious and susceptible, the probability that an infected agent will interact with a susceptible one is given by S0, and beta is again the rate of interaction. And then one over gamma, I mentioned before, that's the typical duration of the illness. So that overall this R0, you can think of it as the number of secondary infections that are generated by an infected person in the time of the illness. And then it kind of makes sense that if R0 is less than one, I'm generating less than one infection while I'm infected, so the epidemic will die out. While if instead during my infection time, I create more than one infection, of course, I'm gonna have an exponential growth. Okay, so this is kind of analysis of the SIR model. Of course, what we are interested in understanding is how can we intervene on the system? How can we basically avoid uh, this large outbreak? Um, 
And the classic way to deal with that has been by looking at, for example, curing or vaccination campaigns. So say, for example, why is vaccination important? Because it will move people from susceptible to recovery, right? It gives immunity directly to people without going through the eye compartment. And so what it does, it basically reduces the number of initial susceptible. So it reduces the reproduction number and hopefully brings it to less than one so that, again, we don't have this exponential growth. And in fact, there's a large literature on, for example, spectra control, which looks at how do you best allocate vaccines so that you reduce this R0 the most for this more complicated model where you have network and demographic structure into it. Um, one important point to make, however, that has highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic is that in the initial phases of an epidemic, this type of intervention may not be possible. And that's why actually it's important to look also at non-pharmacological interventions, so all NPIs. And so what are these? I mean, all unfortunately, we're all very familiar with that. That's testing, isolation, and lockdowns. And one important point that I want to make is that these are very different type of intervention than the classic like vaccine type of intervention for two main reasons. So the first reason is that these type of intervention are actually only effective while you are applying them. So a vaccine, you apply to one person and that person is hopefully immune forever on or for a very long time, but you don't need to keep vaccinating it, right? Um, instead for lockdown, clearly you, you need, like the lockdown is effective while it's in place, but the moment you remove the lockdown policy, the system will go back to the situation that you had at the beginning, right? So these are only effective until they are in place. And the second important thing to note is that they, while they are in place, they have important economic consequences due, for example, to loss of jobs, but they also have social repercussion due to isolation or mental problems. And so this kind of brings out some new questions in this standard mathematical epidemiology framework of how can we actually understand these complex trade-offs between objective for the epidemic, for controlling the epidemic dynamics, but on the other end, also social and economic repercussion of these interventions. And is there a way to design some optimal policies that will dynamically basically optimize between these two different aspects? Um, and so this is a little bit what the talk outline is gonna be. So what I'm gonna do is gonna try to look at some of these questions, some of these trade-offs for two particular interventions. So in the first part of the talk, I will look at lockdown. And in the second part, I will look about surveillance testing. Okay, so if there's no question for this introductory part, I will just go to the first part about optimal lockdown. And again, this is work that I've done in collaboration with Asumano Stagler, Daron Asimoglu from MIT, and Giacomo Como and Leonardo Cianfanelli from Polytechnic of, of Torino. Okay, so um, again, the point is that lockdowns are significantly costly both in terms of economic losses, but also for mental health, social isolation type of considerations. And so what we want to do and what's important to do is understand what are the trade-offs between epidemic and economic slash social costs. And there's been a number of work that started investigating this direction motivated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on a framework that was first introduced by this paper in Alvarez et al. Um, and I will kind of use this framework, build on this framework to evaluate performance of different type of lockdown policies and hopefully get some indication of how to choose indicators and thresholds for reopening. And so to introduce the model of Alvarez, this is exactly what I've discussed before, right? This is the standard SIR model. This is the standard dynamic we've seen before with the reproduction number as I've defined it before. Um, so the question that Alvarez poses is how do we model lockdown on top of that? And remember, beta was this parameter that had to do with level of interaction. So in some sense, what the lockdown is gonna do is gonna change this parameter beta. So in order to capture that effect, what Alvarez suggests is to introduce a new variable, L of T, uh, which is gonna be the fraction of people that I'm supposed to be in lockdown. And again, know that this is a function of time because I allow my lockdown to change dynamically in time. And then theta is gonna be the effectiveness of this lockdown. And this is just due to the fact that even if I impose uh, complete lockdown, there's gonna be a fraction of the population that's still allowed to move because of essential worker or because of non-compliance. So overall, effectively, 
the fraction of population that's free to mix is going to be one minus this theta LT. And importantly, I have this fraction of susceptible that are free to mix and this fraction of susceptible that are free is of infected that are free to mix. So that when I look at my dynamics, I will have this term squared. And again, this is because I have both S and I, so I'm reducing both of them by this fraction and I have a square in there. And so I, now this is kind of looks very similar, right, to the SIR model we had before. It's just instead of the beta parameter, you can think of you have a time varying beta one minus theta L squared type of parameter. And so you can define what is the new reproduction number of this system. And it's easy math to see that this is the old reproduction number before the intervention times this one minus theta L squared. And so really the idea here is to select the lockdown to try to reduce this reproduction number to kind of flatten the curve, right? If I reduce the reproduction number, my growth is gonna be somehow slower and I will have a um, lower peak. And so that's basically the idea of the core idea of how you think about lockdowns. Now, of course, associated with this lockdown, I have to model what is the cost of it. And again, the important thing is that this is something that um, is a dynamic intervention that holds in time. So my cost is gonna be an integral over my time horizon. And note that this time horizon is from time zero to some time capital T, which we assume is the time to the vaccine, because hopefully when the vaccine comes, um, the lockdown may be released. Um, and again, what is the cost I'm integrating over? This has two sides. On the one end, I have economic cost, and this is just proportional to the lockdown level. W here is the wages, which we are gonna assume normalized to one. So this is just cost related to the fact that people cannot go to do their jobs. Um, and then, of course, I have an epidemic cost, which in Alvarez is model, uh, modeling the number of deaths, which is just the integral over my time horizon of the rate of infected times the mortality rate. And importantly, the mortality rate, we assume, is a fine in, in the infected um, state. Uh, because the more basically infected you have in your system, the more congestion and pressure you put in the health system. And so the mortality rate could become higher, for example, because of ICU congestion. So really here we have these two basically way to capture economic and epidemic costs. And the only parameter I've not described is this kappa parameter, which you really should think of it as a tuning parameter between these two type of uh, consideration that you are making. And an important point that I want to make is that I will never tell you what this kappa should be. I think that's up, up to the policymaker to decide what this kappa parameter should be. So really our analysis aims at understanding what are the different trade-offs when we use this as a tuning parameter. So we'll see when we change kappa, how does the optimal solution to this optimal control problem looks like. And before going into that, um, I just want to give a quick introduction about like policies uh, for epidemic control. Actually, this can be divided in two broad classes, and this is true not only for lockdown, but generally for policies uh, in epidemic model. Um, so a first large class of uh, intervention is what is known as suppression intervention, where the idea is that you want to eradicate your disease as fast as possible. That's, of course, the best you can do for the epidemic cost, but will typically have high economic cost. Um, at the other extreme, we have mitigation policies, where instead you're saying, well, I don't actually want to eradicate completely the disease. I just want to slow it down so that my health system can catch up. And that typically is less uh, expensive from an economic perspective. And I just want to mention that policies that um, countries have used actually range in different uh, level of the spectrum between suppression and mitigation. So some countries did actually impose very strong lockdowns. And for example, New Zealand, in an example of that, they almost reached uh, eradication of the disease. While other countries, for example, Sweden, they had more modest restriction. And of course, they paid less of an economic price. So there's really no clear um, winner strategy, even in what the countries did. And so the first thing that we want to ask a quick question. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just oh, on the previous slide, uh, you had a tuning parameter and the epidemic cost. Now, is that where you would fold in issues like, uh, you know, our, our the economic cost of a death, for example? Yeah, exactly. This uh, is kind of like economic. I, I hate calling it like that, but like in economics term, this kappa would be the value of life. So it's like, and, and they really think of it in the sense like a debt is equivalent to 40 years of our wages or something like that. So it's uh -huh. like 
I mean, I don't like thinking it in that term, honestly. I think it like as a tuning parameter uh, between these two and then is a policymaker that's gonna decide what that should be. Uh, but yes, that's in, in some sense, this is number of debts, this is an economic cost. So kappa is something that makes these two things comparable according to some scale that some policymaker is gonna decide how to fix. Uh, um, and this is like a whole philosophic and ethical question in there, how, how do you fix this kappa? Indeed. But isn't that the beauty of your model that you, you have allowed that to be a variable and say, OK, whichever approach you choose to take, you can choose the appropriate value. Yeah, I think that that's kind of makes it I think mathematical modeling helps people formalize their thought right in a systematic way. And then like it's clear what you're trying to do. And then somebody will decide what, what the right value of that is. And this, again, is like based on this Alvarez um, uh, model that they suggested. So that comes from them. Or at least okay. fight over correct value. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Um, okay, so again, the first thing that we wanted to understand is tuning this value of kappa. What do we get? Do we get that the optimal policy is more of a suppression or a mitigation type of policy? And indeed, uh, what it's emerged is that you kind of have a like threshold behavior where if your value of kappa is large, um, like, and this would correspond to this point here, the optimal policy looks like a suppression policy. And you see that because in this plot here, we have percent uh, fraction of deaths and here economic loss. And you see like uh, that is very small, but of course with high economic loss. Uh, well, instead, if you tune this kappa parameter at some point, there's gonna be a jumping point where the optimal control would go for a mitigation type of strategy. And which of course has higher level of deaths, but less economic loss. Um, and really what the optimal control here is trying to do is to say, well, I cannot really keep in lockdown my population forever, it's too expensive. So let me find the best way to approach herd immunity to try to contain the deaths. And so that's what's happening here. These strategies will try to reach herd immunity. Again, because after herd immunity, I don't need to control anymore. I don't need a lockdown anymore because the number of infected will naturally go down. And one important thing that I want to make is that like this, you see this trade off in terms of this kappa parameter, but in fact, you also see them if you tune other parameters, like for example, the time to vaccine. So again, if the time, your expected time to vaccine is short, you can afford to keep lock, stringent lockdown. And so you have a suppression type of strategy as the optimal solution to the control problem that I described before. But if the time to vaccine becomes longer and longer, then at some point you will have to switch to a mitigation strategy just because it's not feasible to keep um, the country in lockdown. And one important thing that I want to mention is here you see some numbers, uh, but again, this, I, I don't want you to take these numbers too seriously. These are for some parameter values and there's actually not consensus of what this parameter should be. I mean, I want you really to focus more on the trends. I mean, so this is kind of a general observation. It's always true that there's gonna be some threshold of time for the vaccine after which you need to switch to mitigation. What this exact threshold is depends on the parameter. So that's not that important in this analysis. Okay, um, so as a second main observation that we understood that um, is like, what, what, what I want to say is that we formulated here an optimal control problem and these plots that I presented before were based on numerical simulation of the optimal control problem. And in fact, most of the literature um, that has looked at these topics really focused on numerical simulation. The problem is that it's very hard to solve analytically that optimal control problem that I've shown you before. Um, the problem with that, however, is that numerical simulation are actually sensitive to the parameters sometimes, and they may provide no guarantee for what happens if my parameter change. Um, so of course, the better approach would be to try to find an analytic solution, but that may not be tractable. And I wanna argue that even if that was tractable, even having the exact optimal solution to the control problem will give you a lockdown as a function of time. And that may or may not be so useful because it's not so like obvious to then connect that back to what's happening to your system. And it's not so obvious how robust this is gonna be if I change something, like if something happens to my system, I would need to basically recompute entirely the, the, the optimal control strategy. So okay. instead, yes? Yeah, sorry, thanks, Francesca. Um, so. Could we just go back to the previous slide for a moment, please? Mm -hmm. So um, on the left-hand side, you've described that um, in the left plot, you've got these kind of two regimes, one where you protect the economy and the other where you uh, protect for death. Um, and it looks like there's really no way to, to deal with that chasm in between. Is, is that a theorem? 
it's not a theorem, it's an observation right now, really, as I was mentioning, that comes from the, the, the simulation. Um, yeah, but, but we did see like, like, like from all basically, uh, I mean, the point is that really like it's this dichotomy between suppression that goes for very strong lockdowns, and then you have very low debts, but very high economic costs, or you do mitigation, then you need to like reach herd immunity. That's the only way mitigation can work. And then there's kind of some yeah, basic I, debt cost that you need to pay to reach herd immunity. And yes. like in, in between strategy would be more yes, worse right. than that. The question is more, um, so, so understood. Um, and I guess I phrased my question badly. Is there any way to get policies that somehow sit in between those two regimes? Mm. Like you would mean like a, you would want a point here, basically, in, in this well, I, I don't know. I mean, um, yeah. maybe as a decision maker, when I look at this, you know, I'm thinking, well, I, I probably, I mean, this is probably a quite an important um, slide to look at if you're a decision maker. Mm -hmm. Do you have to live in the top left or the bottom right? Or is there some sort of knee in a curve somewhere? I mean, let, let me put it that way. I think it's an interesting question. In all the simulation for all the parameters we've seen, we have tried, we saw this, this big jump. Like that basically um, a policy, like in, in some sense, if you want, you won't have a point here, you would have a point here. Like there's not in the Pareto frontier. Like it would be like, if you go for this strategy, then it would be better to either go for this extreme or that extreme. I know that this is kind of like a very, it's, it's really a jump. Like, yeah, so and, and, I mean, there really is a qualitative difference between these kinds of controls. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, they will be, they will look totally different. We're going to see that a little bit in a moment, also like how different, like really the lockdown profile looks like uh, in between a point here and a point there. Okay, thank you. Okay, so basically what I was saying here that what we focus on this work is actually not, not much solving the optimal control problem, but instead considering some like feedback policies based on indicators that governments have considered. And in particular, we focus as indicator the reproduction number. And again, the idea is that if you control the reproduction number, you contain the growth rate of your curve. And on the other end, uh, we look at number of infected, again, with the idea that would not overload the health system. And so what is the advantages of focusing on policies based on these indicators is that these are, again, are currently being considered by governments to decide how to switch between different phases of their lockdown. And they are, in some sense, closed loop policy that depends on the state of your system instead of just time, as you would get from an open loop policy solution of the optimal control. So hopefully they get some more robustness into it. And so the question that we wanted to understand is, well, which indicator is better actually for this cost function that I discussed before? And how suboptimal are these policies based on the indicators with respect to actually the optimal control policy? And actually, hopefully, eventually get some insight of how do we design these phases for reopening. Um, so to do that, let me describe a little bit more in detail the type of lockdown policies that we consider. Again, the first one is based on the reproduction number. And so the idea, remember, in the lockdown, we have this controlled reproduction number that depends on the uh, lockdown level. So first, we consider a class of policies that aims at containing this reproduction number below a desired threshold. So this R0 max, you should think of it as a parameter of your policy that you can decide what level you want to put. And then you select your lockdown level such that the control reproduction number is always below this threshold. And you can compute what the lockdown is. And again, this threshold may be something below one, in which case you will get a suppression scenario, right? Like you will have infected go down, or it may be something slightly above one, uh, which means you would allow some growth, but in a slow manner with respect to the uncontrolled growth. And so the first question we want to address is now we have a family of parametric policies. Uh, how do we select the R0 max? What's the best way of R0 max? And so to answer this question, we derive the analytically the cost associated to a policy that has level R0 max. And I kind of just want to give you briefly the intuition. So when you have a policy of that form, what happens is you have two phases. Like initially your R0 would be above one. So you need the lockdown. Um, and so that's the first phase here where you have an active level of lockdown. And again, what's happening is that this is gonna constrain your control R0 to the desired threshold. And that actually gives us 
a linear system for the dynamics, things will simplify so we can compute exactly what economic and epidemic cost in this phase is. And then after a certain time, you will reach a point where your uncontrolled R0 is one. So this is herd immunity point. Um, and so from that on, you actually don't need the control anymore. So in order to look at this phase here, we know that we have zero economic costs because there's no lockdown anymore in the second phase. Um, and so the only thing that's slightly complicated to compute here is the epidemic cost. And remember the epidemic cost as this integral of something that depends on infected plus the terms that depend on infected square coming from the fact that the mortality rate has an I inside. Um, and this is kind of not easy to compute because actually just solving analytically for I as a function of time in the SIR model is not tractable, but it turns out that you can actually think simplify when you take the integral. And so we have some nice analytic results in there that allow us to compute exactly these integrals of I and I square as a function just of the state of the epidemics at the two extreme. And I don't want to go to the details of that, but I just want to put it there as a nice kind of results in analysis of uncontrolled SIR models. So using that, basically, we are able to compute the epidemic cost as well in phase two, so that now we have basically for any value over zero max, we know what is the associated cost. And again, what we want to do is select the best value over zero max, so we can then solve an optimization problem to select what is this threshold that we should put to minimize um, the overall cost, even by economic plus epidemic cost. And note that, again, depending on the parameter, this may be below one or above one. So this is a case where the optimal thing for this parameter was an R0, which is slightly above one. So we would allow a little bit of growth. So that would be kind of a mitigation type of strategy. And then, so this was one big class that we considered. The other big class was in, uh, instead aiming at controlling the number of infected. And so the idea here, we want to keep number of infected people below a desired threshold I max. And again, this is, we are going to treat it as a parameter. So we have a family of policies parameterized by this I max. How many infected should I allow to have in my population? Um, and again, you can compute what is the lockdown profile that we guarantee that. And it turns out the solution is actually quite easy. This was starting in here. Um, so you will just not do any lockdown until you reach the threshold. And then when you are at the threshold, you select the value of lockdown that keeps your derivative equal to zero so that you will stay basically at the threshold until you reach herd immunity. And so from that on, then it goes down uh, on its own. And again, the key important thing here is that IMAX, again, is a design parameter. So what we were able to do is compute what is the cost associated to each choice of IMAX. And then we can minimize over that to understand what's the best possible value to set this parameter in my policy. And then of course, interesting, like what, what our aim was, was to compare these two policies. So we are now the best policy that controls the reproduction number and the best policies that control the number of infected. And we plotted again as a function of this kappa parameter that we had before. Um, and so in blue here is the performance in terms of total cost for the controlling the reproduction number. And this is in magenta, the controlling the number of infected. And I think like there's two main things to observe from this plot. Uh, so the first thing to observe is that controlling the number of infected performs better than controlling the reproduction number. And this is somehow may come to a surprise to uh, people because we are so used of like the key objective is to keep the reproduction number below one or controlling the reproduction number. But I think like part of the reason why we get this result is that this, this type of analysis of reproduction number is related to classic type of intervention where you just pay it once. Here instead, like it's an intervention that has a cost over a period of time. So really you need to look at it as an optimal control problem. And it turns out that for that optimal control problem, it's better to like maintain the number of infected below at a certain threshold. And then the second thing that we note um, is that if we plot the numerical simulation from the optimal control, these are the dots, and this is kind of a lower bound that we computed analytically, we see that actually this policy that controls the number of infected is very close to optimality. And again, this is based on numerical simulation. So we are working on trying to give some guarantees, like the lower bound was an effort to do that, but there is some gap there to be improved. But at least for this parameter, you see like it's not a bad policy to control the number of infected. It's almost identical to the um, optimal control. And I should mention that these parameters here, this range that we look at are for mitigation. Um, if you look at parameters where you actually, the optimal control would choose suppression, 
then all these policies pretty much behave in a very similar way. So if your objective is actually suppression, um, all of these would work um, and you don't need to care about the differences. Okay, so this is basically the conclusion of the first part here. Uh, so I think what we did was to look at different policies based on these different indicators that government are considering about the reproduction number and number of infected. And we saw what are the like different trade-offs based on this cost that combines economic and the epidemic part. And as I mentioned, this is very much ongoing work. Um, so we are working on providing near optimal guarantees for the threshold policy based on the infected numbers. And we are also working to extend that to more complex model than the SIR model. Again, this is just based for the SIR model. So we would like to incorporate some more network structure to account, for example, for different demographic ages of people that would lead to like a network SIR model. Um, and we are working on uh, addressing that particular problem. Okay, so that's the end of like part on the lockdown. Um, so unless there's question, I will then move to the second part, which is about testing. Okay, and this part here is based on works with Arona Semoglu, Ali Rezapella, uh, Daniel Hattenlocker, Azumano Stagler, and Salah Patil from MIT, and Andrea Gemeto, which is here from CEE. And really part of the motivation why we got interested in testing as well as a non-pharmaceutical intervention is that as I kind of argue in the first part of this slide, um, lockdown are effective, but they have high social and economic cost. Um, and so as an alternative, what countries have started looking around is, well, can I instead do intensive testing, surveillance testing policy to try to remove infected people from interacting with others and so allow to reopen basically my country, but by keeping infection under control because of testing. And we saw that there were some example, encouraging examples from some countries. And then on a smaller scale, I think we all experience here at Cornell, like the success of uh, frequent uh, testing policy that really allow us to reopen our campus in a safe way. So how does this high level, how does surveillance testing work? Again, I just wanna kind of go back to our SIR model and explain what is the, the main idea of why surveillance testing work. And to do that, I'm going to divide my I compartment. So before that we had SIR, now I'm going to divide the I compartment into two parts. So there's going to be one part, which is infected undetected agents. So these are people that are infected, but they don't know about it. Maybe they are asymptomatic, so they are free to circulate and spread the disease. And so the key role of surveillance testing is to detect these people and so move them from another, from IU to ID compartment, which are infected detected people which we will put in quarantine and isolate so that they are actually not able to infect others. So really what testing does is adding this new event that brings people from this infected undetected to infected detected compartment at some rate theta, which is the testing rate that I'm applying with some effectiveness theta. And you can compute what is the reproduction number for this system and you can kind of convince yourself pretty easily that's how it modifies. So the, the part about interaction remains the same here. So before we were kind of modifying the beta, now we're not touching the beta at all. What we are touching is the length of time that people are free to circulate while ill. Right? Before that was just gamma. Now, because of testing, we are kind of catching these people earlier. So we are reducing the time that they are free to interact with other and spread the disease. So that's another way basically to reduce the reproduction number by increasing the denominator instead of decreasing the numerator, basically. That's, that's the core idea of testing. So this seems amazing, right? Like, but what's the drawback of that? Well, the drawback is that for some reasonable put into bracket uh, parameters uh, for COVID-19. And this is in brackets because um, there's no consensus of what the parameters should be. And in fact, they probably keep changing because of policies and because of people's behavioral responses. But let's say roughly for some reasonable value of parameters in order to really control and bring your R0 less to one with testing, you need to, again, roughly test every person in your population twice a week. And that's kind of what we are seeing here at Cornell, right? Student, we are asking them to get tested twice a week. Uh, and of course, if you can do that, that's amazing. And you should do that. And that's the best thing that you can do if you have the resources for doing so. Uh, but the problem is that testing is expensive. So there are some universities or businesses that may either don't have that resources or don't want to invest that resources. 
Um, and on the other side, I mean, uh, again, at the beginning of an epidemic, it may be that even if you have the resources, there really just are supply constraint or logistical difficulties so that you cannot achieve that high level of testing. Or later on in the pandemic or in an epidemic, you may run into non-compliance issue due to behavioral response to people that start like uh, getting used to this and don't want to get tested anymore at that high frequency. So that may also happen, like people will not comply with this high frequency testing for very, very long periods of time. So the question that we wanted to address is, well, can we actually address this by dynamically optimizing the testing frequency? And the idea here is that maybe you don't want always to be testing at that high frequency, but you want to change your testing frequency based on the prevalence of the disease in your population. And so the question that we wanted to investigate is, is this at all possible or will the system actually uh, uh, have an exponential growth? And so this is kind of in line of a general area, again, of research that was motivated by the COVID-19 pandemic of how do you optimally allocate scarce testing resources for epidemic control? And so what we did in this work was actually to consider two different types of testing. Um, so the first is molecular testing. This, I guess, is the one everybody's used to by now is uh, in COVID-19, this is QPCR, which gives information about current infection, right? So this is the standard for diagnosis uh, because it allows you to detect and isolate active cases. And so this is what you need for control, right? You want to isolate people while they have the disease so that they will not spread it further. Uh, but then in this work, we're also considering a second type of testing, which is known as serology testing. Uh, which is a little bit different because it doesn't really detect the virus itself, uh, but it detects antibodies produced by your uh, body in reaction to the virus. And so this kind of gives you information about whether uh, you had some infection in the past because these antibodies will remain in your system. And again, you see like this is not necessarily that useful for diagnosis because the, this uh, agent is probably recovered by now. I mean, they can actually detect uh, active cases with some lower effectiveness, but most importantly, this is used for knowing about past cases. Uh, and I'm gonna argue that that's important to actually get an estimate of what the state of your epidemic is. And I'm gonna argue that this is fundamental if you want to go into dynamic policies. So really the type of um, approach that I'm gonna focus on is again, working on a standard SIR model, so not directly applicable to COVID, what we are going to do is we are going to derive what is the optimal molecular testing rate for control. And then prove, and we're going to see that this is dynamic and actually is again in a feedback formula that depends on the state of your epidemic. And we are going to argue that to estimate the state of the epidemic, you can use serology testing. So really the overall procedure that we suggest is something like this, where you have both serology and molecular testing. You use serology testing to kind of get an estimate of the state of your system. And then you use this estimated state to design what is the optimal molecular testing rate. Okay, so let me go to the first part about oh, how do we design actually the optimal testing rate. And here I'm gonna work under the assumption that we know the state. So say we knew what is the percentage of susceptible infected and recover we have in the population, what is the optimal way to test uh, people? And to do that, um, again, we're gonna use this model where we have this compartment of I that is um, divided in two uh, undetected and detected categories. Um, and the only thing is that we're going to now allow this testing rate theta to be time varying. And so what we want to do is design this time varying testing rate. Um, and again, we want to design it in order to minimize the overall testing need. Here we're assuming an infinite horizon. So if you want, this is in the extreme where we'll never get a vaccine. Um, and to begin with, let me actually impose the epidemic constraint by saying that we want the undetected and infected to be less than a certain threshold. And uh, I know this is not exactly what you want. What you want you probably is the total number of infected, but I wanna go through this case to develop some intuition and then I'm gonna generalize it in a minute to the case when you put the threshold on the total number of infected. So again, here the problem is, can we find the optimal testing rate to minimize this cost function subject to this constraint Again, a little bit motivated by the fact that we this is kind of the relevant constraint also in the lockdown part. And so our first result here is to show that the optimal control uh, is actually time varying and is in feedback form. So it depends on the state of your system. It depends on the number of susceptible. 
And in fact, what the optimal control does is pretty intuitive. So what it does, you see in black here is the testing rate. In blue is the number of infected undetected, the quantity you want to have below the threshold, and in red, you have the threshold. And so what the optimal control does is pretty much does nothing until the infected reaches the threshold. And then the moment the infected reach the threshold, it selects the testing rate such that the derivative is zero so that it will keep the number of infected at the threshold until you reach herd immunity and then it goes naturally down to zero. And the way we prove this result is by using the theory of most rapid approach paths. So in some sense, what this control is doing is trying to reach herd immunity in a safe way. So maintaining the number of infected below your desired threshold. And uh, again, as I mentioned, in reality, what you want is not the, just the number of undetected to be below the threshold. You want the total number of infected to be below the threshold. And you may also have some upper bound on the instantaneous testing rate. That is the number of testing rate that you can do every day. So you can plug that in and the core intuition will remain the same. So again, like if we look at number of infected, we let it grow up to the threshold and then we keep it there until herd immunity. There are some things that are slightly more complicated in how you achieve that with the testing rate due to the fact that the derivative of the quantity you want to control now does not depend explicitly on the testing rate. So you cannot instantaneously switch the derivative to zero. And that's why here the, the testing kind of becomes, uh, starts a little bit earlier to kind of slow down the growth such that you reach this in a tangent way. But again, these are kind of details. But again, the important point is that the optimal control here is again, can be computed in a type of feedback form that depends on the state of the epidemic and we will be time bearing. And again, I wanted to stress the fact that this depends on the state of the system because clearly this type of approach can only work if you have a precise estimate of the state of the system. Like if, if you think your state is different than what it is, you will apply, of course, a different uh, type of uh, testing rate than what you need, and this could lead to very bad consequences. So that's why kind of the second thing that we look at is, can we actually estimate the state of the epidemic uh, from the data that we observe? And quite surprisingly, I have to say, what we notice is that you cannot actually do that um, if you just look at detected infection from molecular testing. And what we prove is formally is that if your time mission rate beta is time varying, again, this may be because of policies or behavioral changes, then the system formally is not observable from the just detected output if you use only molecular testing. And so what does this mean is basically that uh, unless you know the initial condition, just observing the number of detected is not enough to let you know what the state of your system is. Um, and kind of the intuition for that is that molecular testing has a very short detectability window, right? So if you don't test frequent enough, you may maybe test an agent here and here, and you may miss this agent entirely. And then you don't know, you think it's acceptable, but it's actually recovered. Um, and so that's why instead we look at serology testing where uh, the detectability window is much longer, right? You don't catch active infections, but you, if this agent had it, at some point you'll know. And so that's why we kind of look into serology testing and we said, can we complement basically our model with that to make sure that we have accurate state estimation? Yeah, uh, question, Francesca. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one thing that we know with um, PCR testing is that it's detecting fragments of the virus. And so in fact, it has quite a long life. Um, once, once you've had the virus, you actually repeatedly detect that person for quite some time. Um, so, so I'm curious about your thought about um, you know, this being a short period. Um, I mean, right now this model here is basically you, I think we check like, we check at some point, like what were the guidelines on the detectability window? I don't remember for, we went for a specific test. I don't remember for which company and we used that kind of as a reference. I think it was on the order of weeks, like two, three weeks, maybe something like that. Um, but yeah, and, and the other thing is like, this is kind of an intuition, but you can actually prove that that really this result holds. Um, and the way we do it is just saying, um, like we fix basically an output that of detected cases. And we show that there are two different um, state initial condition that will produce that same output. So in some sense, this kind of as an intuition, but it's not a formal proof. That's not only that that's going on in there. We really have a formal proof that for the same output that you observe, um, you kind of uh, get different 
different uh, uh, internal state that are consistent with the output. And again, that's under the assumption that basically what we, what we are imposing is that, um, I mean, let me put, go to this model. Basically what we are imposing is that molecular only gives you information about current infection. So if, if instead, like, as you say, I can catch also part of the uh, recover from that, that kind of goes into the serology uh, type of aspect that at the end of the day, what's important to us is like these arrows <laughs> independently of where they come from. So in some sense, so it's like, if we can also catch recovered, um, I guess that would modify it a little bit because here we assume that serology can always catch recover from ever on. Like so, and, and that's also has its own limit, but it was in the time scale like of months. So we said, okay, that's a reasonable assumption. So that may be something that we need to kind of look a little bit more in the detail in there. Yeah, I guess, you know, I'm certainly not gonna argue with the math, right? <laughs> so that, uh, that, that's certainly solid, but, um, uh, but 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 this is sort of one um, you know one thought that I think actually could actually be useful, right? So you could you could say that there is this signal actually in PCR testing, and I guess the other thought is that there are also other ways of trying to get a sense of what beta is as a function of time. So I'm working on something separately with a group in Australia, and there we're actually explicitly trying to get at that. Um, yeah, that would be super interesting because I think like if you have the information of here, we are trying to estimate basically the state and the beta at the same time. But if you get the estimate of beta from some other outside source, then molecular testing would be enough, actually. Like if you know the beta, then molecular test is enough on its own. So I think, yeah, that, that would be uh, super interesting to look how to incorporate. And I think like in some sense, this is kind of like, I mean, there's two pieces, right? So if you can get to perfect state estimating with just molecular testing, that's perfect. Then you can implement like the uh, optimal time varying testing just from that, right? So this was more like a, something that if you cannot, then you can use serology. Great, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so how do we incorporate serology again? That's like this structural difference that we assume serology gives us information about their cover as well, not about just current infections. Um, and so we show that with this additional thing, our system becomes observable. And again, this is a structural property that does not depend on test sensitivity. And this is something important to stress because serology test is typically less sensitive uh, than molecular. But the point is that uh, we just need to get some signal out of it. And that's enough for observability. And I'm running out of time. So just would I really briefly to conclude what we did is this is kind of an a priori like result that says if I have perfect observation with no noise. So what we did in order to test the robustness of this, we also did simulation with the stochastic model that I've mentioned at the very beginning. And then we tried to use a Kalman filter to kind of estimate the state from this like noisy measure that we got. Um, and uh, uh, we used like a Langevin approximation of the stochastic epidemic dynamics to estimate what the process noise is for the Kalman, for the tuning of the Kalman filter. Um, and so this is kind of just some plot to show you that indeed also in this stochastic environment, we can kind of control the total number of infected to the desired threshold. This works for single realization, but also for multiple realization. And the main message here is that we can use this dynamic policy and at least for the parameter we tried, significantly reduce the number of tests that are needed. Okay, so with this, I actually wanted to conclude um, and uh, um, just let me mention a few caveats. Again, here we claim optimality in terms of this problem that we discussed, where the only objective is to contain the number of infection below a desired threshold. So again, that's a containment versus suppression type of strategy. And again, these are results for SIR models. So before implementing that into COVID and to practice, clearly like there's some more steps that are needed, but we hope this gives some general insight of what are the forces at play here that can then be fine-tuned with more uh, sophisticated models. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any more questions, I'm happy to answer. Excellent. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Any further questions? So I have a question. So I'm in an older uh, demographic group and I was wondering whether you people have thought about running the, doing the kind of thing you're doing with, you know, multi aged or multiple groups of people. Um, for example, uh, people of my age took the uh, quarantine pretty seriously as far, not quarantine, but just being really careful about what mm -hmm. I do. Um, also there's different costs associated with uh, 
uh, people in different age groups. In other words, we, older people are more likely to end up being uh, a problem in the, in, in the intensive care, you know, being sent to intensive care because they tend to get more, uh, you know, more severe symptoms, et cetera. So I was just curious if that, it seems to me that, that this could be what you're doing, which is really, really interesting, could be extendable to look into to that. Uh, I think also about when there was uh, some kind of a motorcycle rally out in, I think it was South Dakota or something with lots and lots of people did, you know, a group of them came in who were not essentially not compliant at all. And uh, the effects it had long term on uh, both the local population and sp spread of the infection. It seems to me that it's sort of a, a um, opportunity here for looking at different groups and seeing how, how one group can affect the results. Yeah, I think like, um, I think this is a brilliant uh, question and some area of research. Like, I mean, my, my main area of research is actually network science. So I love understanding like network effects between different groups. Um, so let me say like, there's been some work that look at that. Like for example, for the lockdown part at the beginning, I know of a work by Asemaglu et al at MIT where they look at two different demographics. Basically they divided young and older people and they show that actually doing targeted lockdown where you kind of uh, do different lockdowns based on the age group is actually beneficial. Like that will improve the performance with respect to uniform lockdowns. Um, as far as I know, all those results are based on numerical simulation. So I haven't found analytic solution of that because of course the optimal control problem is already like very hard with one group. So when you start having multiple groups, it becomes more complicated. We have some work preliminary in that direction, but uh, um, yeah, it's very preliminary at the moment. Um, and then I think like there's not only demographic, I think another super interesting effect is if you have regional effect to that. Like for example, in Italy, I know of a world that's super interesting where they look at what if the government did different lockdown policies for the different region of Italy? And again, they show that that improves with respect to national type of lockdown policies. So I think these are all considerations that are absolutely important um, and interesting to look at. And there's some research effort that goes into that direction. Um, it's a little bit harder to get some analytic tractable results out of it, but I think like, once you get the insight, maybe from the single group model, it's very interesting to study at least numerically how that would extend and apply to different groups. So yeah, that, that's definitely, um, there's interest for those type of questions and I think they're very relevant in order to apply this in practice. Excellent, other questions? All right, well, thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you so here. much for having me. Much enjoyable. Hope everyone enjoys the day. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Bye.